Well, I, I'm really very happy to, to introduce Melanie Pennant, uh, is the VP of Human Capital Management Integration. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Close enough. It's fine. I apologize. <laughs> it's all right. Um, and I'm really happy, too, that Melanie brought with her Paul Beatty. And why I like this, Paul, you're responsible, you're a VP for the uh, systems, right. systems side of the house. One of the things that hopefully you've been hearing as we bring in folks from the outside, and I try to impress upon you, is the fact that implementations like this are only important if you've got these two players together. You've got to have the technology in support of the business processes, and together that's what makes it successful. So it's great to see that Melanie brought along her counterpart from the technology side to show you really the importance of, of their relationship and their integration to make this whole thing happen. So that excites me because that's something I know I've been trying to tell you guys. Um, so let's go ahead and give them the opportunity to tell us all about Comcast and their use of SAP's ERP product. So let me just drive this way. Um, so, yeah, do you mind? Oh, that's perfect. So Paul is the technology side and the PMO, the project management side of this implementation, and I'm the HR business partner. Um, and, you know, it is so critical that you partner in an implementation as complex as what we're undergoing in order to meet the needs of the client, you know, while obviously managing cost and the complexity of what you're building. So, um, Paul and I are good friends. Miraculously, we're still good friends at, at the near end of this implementation, um, which is critically important that you put together the right team, and I'll talk about that as we, as we go through the deck. So, let me give you a sense of Comcast. And... The business case, what led us to the purchase of SAP. Um, I've been there for 14 years, and just by way of background, um, when I first came to the company, we actually used Abra as our HR platform, um, database, if you will. We went from Abra to PeopleSoft, so we have had the Cadillac of systems, all right? Um, we realized about two years into PeopleSoft, we were using about an eighth of the functionality, yet paying gazillion dollars for people saw. So we migrated from that to Horizon and to EB2 and here's where we are now making a huge conversion to SAP's human capital management module. And I'll talk a little bit about what's involved in that implementation. But what led us to this purchase? So the business model. Let me ask you a question. So how much do people really matter in your business model? In other words, what is the economic difference between an average employee versus a truly outstanding employee? I would suggest to you it's from zero to infinity. We've got a clicker here. Oh, there we go. I can click I this. Can, guess. can I click this? That's a mic. That's a mic? Okay. It's a mic. <laughs> I'm not in charge of technology at Comcast, right? Thank God. All right. So. Going to the next slide and going to the next slide. So here's the two minute recap of our industry and of cable in general. All right, when we started as a company in the 60s, it started with the purchase of a small cable system in Tupelo, Mississippi. We still own that system. We were the only player in town. We were the only player in town in many towns if you wanted cable, right? We were a monopoly with a small M and we liked it that way, right? So if you wanted cable, you came to us. Pretty simple business model. Product was simple. We hired a technician, we trained the tech how to hook up cable to the back of your TV, hook that up to a line out to the pole or underground in more recent years, and the distribution of our service was again, very simple, very linear. Now not so much. We're no longer a cable company. We're into multiple businesses, multiple services. So now we not only offer video, cable, traditional cable, um, but we offer internet and we offer telephone service. So we've now entered a space where others are playing. Similarly, others like Verizon, for example, have entered our space. And now we're in the competitive battle of our lives. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that price matters, right? You all compare prices. Our customers compare prices. How much is Comcast vis-a-vis -vis Dish? vis-a-vis -vis Verizon, what can I get for what deal this month? So we're in a, an environment where price didn't matter before. We were the only game in town. Not so anymore. Price does matter. So what are the people implications? 
Obviously with this transformation in our industry, the convergence of this technology, the fact that people have choice and can go somewhere else means that we're in a new environment now where sophisticated products, more complex products are being offered. The jobs are more complex. All right, so the technician that we hired in 1969 to hook up cable in your home is not the tech we hired today. That tech now needs to know multiple services, needs to under the, understand the complexities of what we offer. Same with customer service. Before, you know, we had a couple reps in Tupelo, Mississippi answering your phone call. They only had to understand one product, and it was pretty simple. Now they've got to understand multiple products. So much more sophisticated products makes our jobs more complex. Products and price will continue to level and re-level our competitors. I don't think we're ever going back to a place where we are the only game in town. And that's the reality that we're in. So what you're going to see is this constant tug of price and product pulling us all into a more level playing field with our competitors. So what's going to make us different? What's going to set Comcast aside? from Verizon, from DISH, from the other competitors that we face. It's going to be your experience with us, right? Service is going to be the differentiator. So if service is the differentiator, then it's going to come down to the people that we hire to deliver that service. Who are we sending into your home? Are we sending the right people? Who are we sending to answer your phone calls, you know, into the call centers? Who are we sending to the call centers to do that? So, you know, I would suggest that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, we could hire somebody out of L.L. Bean to answer the phone. We could train them. They could get by. And if we lost them, we lost them. Now that investment in people is so much more significant because the training that we now have to put our people through to understand the complexity of the products that we deliver and then once we train those people, do we want them going to Verizon to sell the very same products and services on our dime? No. So it's a very different landscape today. So the investment in people looks very different. And I would suggest to you that we're a company that's still really getting our arms around what it means to develop talent. Because we never had to before. You know, especially in Philadelphia. We're the only game in town if you want to work in telecommunications. You know, and we took that for granted. So the shifting the mindset of our leaders in the company around talent has been significant. But it's, been, it's had a very real business impact, um, this shift that I'll talk to you next. So what are C-level execs saying? This is from an Accenture survey that went out asking CEO-level folks, you know, what's on their mind? You know, what is it going to take to achieve strong financial performance? And you can see here, look at the blue, the yellow, and the red. It's all about customer relationships, market share. It's about talent, hiring and retaining the right talent, developing that talent. And it's about having a flexible organization that responds to the changing market conditions. So, you know, in terms of what's on the minds of our leaders, this captures it. And this is outside of our industry. This data reflects leaders from outside our industry as well. So I'm not going to get into the complexity of this slide. Suffice to say, when you think about an employee, think about the employee's life cycle. Think about you as a business defining what your needs are, going out and hunting that talent down, right? Hiring that talent, developing that talent, and hopefully, hopefully cultivating that talent to meet your business needs. I would suggest, prior to SAP, and, and you know, most recently leading up to the purchase of SAP, we did not do this well at all. A, we didn't have a system or an infrastructure to support the employee life cycle holistically. Secondly, we didn't value the employee life cycle like we need to now because we are losing talent. So let me give you a picture of what we were like before HCM, before human capital management. Um, we had an onerous approval process. So you say to yourself, well, what does that mean? All right, so let's say I, I interview Paul. I like Paul, he's my final candidate. I want to make Paul an offer. In a pre-SAP world, it would take me, on average, sometimes three to four weeks to send a physical paper around the company to obtain signatures, have it not get lost, have it not get buried, get it back to Philadelphia, where I would say, okay, good, I can issue him an offer letter. Three to four weeks. What do you think would happen in three to four weeks? 
Where does Paul go? Because I don't have my act together as a company. It starts with a V. Verizon. Yes. So we were losing talent. Okay. I talked about losing CAEs, losing um, you know customer account executives, people that answer the phone, um, our technicians. But more importantly, we're losing talent at some of these critical, unique niche positions. You know, positions in engineering that are hard to come by. You know, positions in business development that are hard to come by because sophisticated candidates aren't going to wait three to four weeks for you to get approval to hire them. Not in a big company like Comcast. So we were losing talent. We had no standards for comparing internal talent. Um, and I'll talk about the demographics of our company in a minute so you can understand and appreciate just how scattered we were and continue to be to some extent. But we have no way of knowing and codifying and having housed in a single system the competencies or the skills and qualifications needed for our most important jobs. And because we didn't have that listing of qualifications by job, our internal candidates, you know, the employees that work for us, didn't know if they were qualified for any particular job when they'd see it on a posting. They would kind of guess, well, it sounds like I might be good for that role, but they wouldn't really know, right? We wouldn't be able to stack one candidate up against another, either external or internal, because we didn't have a consistent set of competencies that we were using to benchmark our talent. And then finally, we had no way of identifying what a particular employee's gaps were in skill set. All right, because we didn't have a competency list to compare them to. Therefore, we didn't know what training to send them for. Therefore, they didn't know how to, you know, how to fill those gaps and then where their growth was leading to. And as a result, what you'll find on a lot of our exit survey data from employees who leave the company is they say time and time again, I've left because I never knew what my path was. I left because I never had a career plan. I left because I didn't know what my next step was. So, gosh, shame on us for losing candidates outright, but shame on us again for not developing the talent we had. Because where do you think they went? Verizon, or the likes of Verizon. Um, so bottom line is, if we're gonna compete in the world we're competing in today, then talent is our greatest asset, and we were in no way positioned um, to attract and cultivate our talent prior to SAP. So, this is what we've been doing. Um, implementing SAP's Human Capital Management Suite the past 18 months, and we're coming to the close of what's nearly 20 months, but this gives you a picture of what we've delivered. Now, Paul can speak to these pieces here, but HCM includes personal administration and organizational management. In essence, it, we have taken all of those relationships that people have in an organization, the relationship between you and your boss, you know, those org charts that people keep in their desk drawer showing who reports to them, we've embedded them in the system. The system is literally driven by these relationships. The system, once you build this, knows that when I issue performance reviews, you know, to managers so they can evaluate their people, the system will know the managers and the people that report to those managers. They'll know, the system knows the relationships because we've told the system what those relationships are. So picture an org chart being loaded into SAP, okay? So we've built that. Talent management, meaning performance appraisals. We used to do performance appraisals on a post-it note, maybe. Some locations, and we've got several, would do po performance appraisals on something homegrown. Now we are using one common system, okay? We have an automated recruiting module. So we are tracking all of the resumes of candidates interested in jobs at Comcast in one central repository. And we're able to search in this database for positions throughout the country. Never had that before. We had some um, means of capturing that electronically, but not as fully integrated as what we see here. Finally, all of our learning, all of our classes are integrated into a system. So we know how to direct people to various learnings based on skill gaps that we're identifying in performance. Our compensation planning, meaning our merit bonus process, our merit and bonus process, our increases are all administered and managed in the system. And payroll is also going to be launched through the system. So we will not have a separate payroll application. We'll be running payroll through SAP as well. Um, and then finally, we're turning on self-service. So the, the idea that employees can get on the computer and look up their own data has always been foreign to us. 
We are now able to launch self-service, which enables the employees to go in, check out their own data, update their address, do various transactions. Managers can now go into this system, look at employee data unlike ever before. You know, so if a manager wanted to see the, let's say, the salaries of the people that worked for them, they would have to go to HR in the past and say, can you give me a list, a spreadsheet, something in Excel that shows me my people and what they make? That's how we did it. Now they can log in. The system, because of what we've built in organizational management, knows who works for that manager. And the manager is able to see not only who works for him or her, but what they make, what job titles they're in, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we're building that. So let me share with you the implementation. Let's click through. OK, we're doing it in four chunks. By the way, and I don't know if you want to comment on this too, but you know, we've heard that it's absolutely unrealistic to implement what we've implemented in 18 months. And we're about near killing ourselves doing it. So I'm not sure you all have an appreciation for what we're going through, but um, this will give you some sense of how we've accomplished. Um, what we've been through. So we're doing it in phases. Um, you'll see here that in May of 07, we put together a project team um, and, and we divided the team into three clusters. There was a team focused on core human resources functionality, a group fo focused on talent management, meaning the performance reviews and the learning, and then finally a payroll group. And so we divided our team into these three teams. And we kicked it off in May of 07. Um, our first release and HCM was self-service, so turning on the ability of employees to be able to see their own data. Huge win for us, um, small victory, got people excited about what was coming because you know additional, more complex functionality was coming later. So we did that first. Secondly, you'll see here in the spring of 08, we launched Core HR and Performance Management. So this was probably the first time in the company's history we launched a common review to all 100,000 employees nationwide. So everybody evaluated their employees' performance on one common review in one common system, among some other um, HR transactions that I'll get to in a little bit. We just this summer launched talent management. So we launched the recruiting module. We launched learning, probably one of our most complex launches from an integration standpoint. And then we're leading up right now to time entry and payroll in December. Doesn't talk too much. So if I moved, I'd have to go knock on HR's door. Can I, can I change my address? HR might remember to send me the form via email. I might get it. They might forget. I might have to go to HR again and say, can I change my address? Form would come. I'd fill it out. I'd send it to HR. HR might get around to sending it, faxing it, in other words, to Philadelphia to have it entered into our EV2 system. Um, but it was all manual. Just to give you a picture, we had no automation for all intents and purposes prior to this. So when an employee would receive a raise, when an employee was hired in any one of our locations throughout the country, HR would fill out a form, and we'll get to this in a minute, and fax it into Philadelphia. So you can imagine how many faxes get lost, how many faxes you can't read, how many faxes are incomplete, so the person getting the fax has to call back, have it refaxed, the delay the lack of efficiency, and then the manual processing for a company 100,000 employees large was, was just extraordinary. I mean, if you think back, how many of you remember the Disney, our play for Disney? A couple. I remember it because I said, holy smokes, from an infrastructure standpoint, there's no way we can purchase a Disney, you know, with faxing. Can you imagine faxing employee salaries into one central location in Philadelphia if we doubled in size. It, it just, it wasn't going to happen. Yes? How long has it taken you to train your employees with the new system? Ongoing. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> I'll cover that. Can you can you hold that thought yeah. and then call me well, on it I, if I, I don't get it? Employees, so, sir, I can briefly say that we actually stopped taking paper yeah. for, for home address changes or direct deposit. Let's see you sign up for direct deposit. It's all like you have to do it yourself. There's not, there wasn't an alternative vehicle. So it's, you know, most of our employees, you know, we're a technology company, so presumably if you can't log into a system and change your 
information if the scratch your head whether or not we should be employing you in the first place. So when you are basically going live during each of these releases, you're completely stopping what you had been doing previously, you're not doing them side by side. It's kind of our mode of operation. Right. Culturally, that's what we do. We just cut everybody off. <laughs> Throw everybody in the deep end, see who swims. I mean, that's pretty much how we've approached this. In 18 months, we didn't have the luxury of hand-holding people during various phases of the functionality. And you'll come to appreciate, because of our approach, how painful this has been. Painful. I mean, Paul and I have bulletproof vests on underneath our gear here because it's just been, it, it, it's been an extraordinary shift for us. But we have done training for every module before launch. So people, if they were, you know, if they were focused on what we were communicating, they had ample opportunity to get ramped up, and they still do. We keep all the training open. People can go back to it as a refresher if they missed it. But there was no alternative. When we say training, it's not this type of instructor that training. It's, no. It's here's a link. It's a it's go a, for it. It's a CBT. Knock yourself out. Yeah. Ten, ten, ten minutes or less. Okay. So you'll see at the top, and, and this is kind of critical because this was an aha moment for us when I sat through SAP training back in May when we launched. And, and they explained to us this whole concept of organizational management, having your org structures, your, your organizational charts embedded in the system, and what all that meant, right? So SAP is driven off of those relationships. Um, it, it dawned on me, wow, if you mess up OM, if those structures are messed up, you know, if, if you report to me, but in the system you're showing reporting to Paul, that means your salary's going to Paul. That means you're on Paul's budget that can really mess up a company, right? Not to mention all the confidential information that's going to Paul that should be coming to me as your manager. So at that moment, I said to myself, wow, you know, we don't want anybody being able to just change things in organizational management. We're probably going to need a core group of people that all those changes float through. So if somebody moves to a new manager, if somebody switches jobs, if we create a new position somewhere in the company, we don't want the field, our locations out in you know various states throughout the country being able to do that in the system. We should probably control that centrally. Hence the birth of the service center. Um, so when I came back from training in, at, at SAP, um, we had a meeting to discuss hiring a core group of people that would manage organizational management and be the only ones to touch it in the system. Because that can mess you up. <laughs> if that's messed up, it can really mess you up. Aside from that, we really realized and appreciated how different the system was and that we were forcing everybody who was used to getting paper, knocking on their HR manager's door and getting, you know, handheld through a process, we were forcing all those people to leave what they knew and go to automation, which is kind of ironic for a technology company that we were concerned about technology. But because of that, we knew we needed folks in a service center environment walking users through how to navigate in the system. So we launched with every release. Um, we hired additional people to support the releases that we launched. And now we have a service center of about 80 people staffed to do organizational management changes and to answer end user calls. Right now, we're taking those calls from human resources and payroll folks only. But when we launch payroll, we will open up to all employees. So if somebody's stuck because they didn't take training, they'll be able to call the service center and get unstuck. So a little bit about Comcast, and I won't dwell on, I'll pick a couple of these. Our demographic profile, we are about 100,000 employees, principally in the United States. We've got a small pocket in Canada. Um, we have about 1,250 unique, discrete locations throughout the country. We're in about 40 plus states, so we're widespread. We're a company that's grown by acquisition. So when I was first hired 14 years ago, we were about six. That will come back to Qantas in later slides. Um, we've got kind of a healthy arrogance about us, kind of this, uh, you know, no deal's too big for us, you know, we can handle anything mentality, which actually served us well on this project. You know, when, when our leaders said, we're going to buy SAP, but here's the deal, you need to get it done in 18 months, here's your budget, we said, all right, you know, near impossible, but okay, um, with no sense that we couldn't do it. So that's helped us. We're very action-oriented, less process-driven. So for us, making this shift, a company that, that's very heavy action and, and now going to a system that relies on consistent process has been a little bit of a shift for us. Finance, this one's important. 
Um, finance is kind of the control source in our organization. So think back to that, that form I showed you in the beginning. When I hi wanted to hire somebody, I needed like 20 signatures on this form before I would be able to hire somebody. Almost all of those 20 signatures were finance leaders in our company signing off that it was okay for me to hire Paul. So what we discovered in going to automation is that SAP is not built for 20 layers of approval on day-to-day -day transactions. Ideally, it's built for one. You know, it's built for manager approval, okay? We built the system to accommodate two levels of approval with some nuances built on top of that. But that was hugely complex for SAP and a dramatic shift, as you can imagine, for us to take control away from our finance folks who could sit on the paper if they didn't want the transaction to happen, right? You know, who could stall um, and leave that process and go to two layers of approval, probably one of which wasn't finance. So this was a pain point for us. This almost brought our implementation to a halt, this shift. What we learned in that is we have huge issues of trust and accountability. Why do you think finance signs off on everything? Because they trust no one. But what we found in this implementation is managers don't trust employees. Managers don't trust managers. SAP is a beautiful system, but it kind of assumes you have an organization of trust that you trust your managers to manage their people and manage their budget. And we were not set up for that given some of our day-to-day -day processes. And SAP exposed that. This implementation exposed it. And then I think I touched on this, um, intellectual appreciation for people development. We know we ought to be reviewing folks. We know we ought to be um, sitting down and talking about what your career aspirations are. But it wasn't part of our makeup, and it wasn't part of our day to day. And this system drives off of those people connections. So that's been, that's been part of our growth. So how we did it, and I'll talk a little, just on a couple of these. We went in and we said, we're going to, we're going to launch out-of-box functionality, meaning vanilla. We're not going to customize. We said that out of the gate. Now, did we stick to that? Yes and no. Um, so we've made some modifications. I would say there's, there's little customization. We did, a, we did customize, but we wanted to set the tone really early on with all of these locations throughout the country that we weren't going to create a system unique to their needs. Because keep in mind, we grew by acquisition. So we grew by the kind of accumulation of all these companies that were used to doing it their way, uniquely to their market, and we forced them to come to one common way, which was a pain point for us, which leads me to the second bullet point. We underwent what I call ruthless standardization. So you can imagine in 14 years all the acquisitions we've had, we never really fully standardized people on, their, on a common set of policies and practices. We kind of let AT&T broadband folks stay on a few AT&T broadband unique policies when we acquired them. Same with Jones, same with Suburban, same with Time Warner, and all these other little acquisitions we've had along the way. We never cleaned that up because we didn't have time. We were always behind. Well, we use this technology as the excuse to get everybody on one common set of policies and practices as much as we could. You think that was painful? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Paul, do you want to talk about the iterative approach? So there's a unique story there. Um, sure. So SAP traditionally, the implementation approaches, and you guys are at MIS, I understand, uh, if I said a, a waterfall methodology, you understand what that means. It's traditional uh, big bang type of uh, software implementation approach where you do discover, design, develop, deploy type of thing. Um, our CIO came from a software development background and was very uh, ingrained in more agile methodologies, Scrum, and, and those type of things for, for, from a true software development um, um, approach versus a packaged software implementation approach. So he uh, guided us and instructed us saying, I want you to use an agile, iterative development approach towards a packaged software implementation, which was culturally for our implementation partner, um, and we talked with SAP, and virtually everybody we talked to, they said, never been done, can't be done. So it's been um, it's been quite a challenge, but it's 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 it's, it's proved beneficial. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. So, HR transformation. Um, as we automated, do you think we changed the nature of what an HR person does in the in our locations? I mean, some of our HR folks count on that knock at the door, right? 
They love that interaction with the manager. They love being depended upon. Well, now we were moving away from that to a place where <coughs> managers were serving themselves in self-service, right? They didn't need HR. So you can imagine the anxiety amongst the, I would say, 1,500 HR practitioners we have nationwide around how their job is shifting and morphing. And we've had to deal with that at the same time that we're implementing this technology. And out of that, there could be layoffs and attrition, and people could end up you know, moving into different roles just by virtue of the change in the role. And that's something that's very real that I think any implementation needs to take into account. And then we made early and swift team composition adjustments, which I'll talk to at the end. So success factors, what mattered? Timeline and budget for us has always been kind of the filters through which all decisions are made, whether it's an acquisition um, or an implementation like this. Okay, so it's, it's very easy for us to decide um, about an element of customization or something that's outside of the original scope of the project when we line it up against timeline and budget. And we, we were given pretty clear guidance. Here's your budget, here's your timeline. Um, did we go over on both? Slightly, but not by much. So that was actually critical to being where we are today. Um, I would say, I'll draw on this one, Use, talking about easy for us to say, wow, you know, SAP, what a cool new set of toys for HR, this is great, we'll be able to do all sorts of really neat things for the people that work for our company, but that would not have resonated and we probably wouldn't have been able to convince our executives to make the purchase with that story, right? We've always talked about this implementation not as a means of, you know, introducing new HR technology to the business, but as a means of being able to attract, retain, develop the talent we need to compete in the environment we're in. So we've always gone back to our business case. Why did we buy this in the first place? Not because it was cool, sexy, and the latest on the block, but because we're losing talent to Verizon because of our own system, lack of infrastructure, and disparate processes. What do we need to do to fix it? SAP. Um, this is kind of unique, and it's something we learned from Coca-Cola when we went to training. Um, actually, when we went to Sapphire, which is kind of a s showcase of SAP technology, um, this big convention they have every year. We met folks at Coke that tried to implement SAP, and they've been through a couple of phases of implementation. The one thing they said to us is, you must have executive sponsorship for this to be successful because you are going to have resistance. People are going to fight this. People aren't going to want technology. Even the people that have begged for it aren't going to want it when they see it. What you need is people at the top of the organization that aren't just going to, on paper, sanction this. But when the, the frustration mounts and the resistance comes, these are the folks that are going to be your messengers, the people making decisions, the people invested. So what we did was we assembled a, a steering committee representing multiple functions in the business. We meet monthly or so, and there are governance. We check in with them, we let them know how the project's going, and when we reach a bump, you know, some significant issue, like finance losing control of sign-off, we take it to this body, and they help us work through that process. So that, that's huge. Without their air cover, support and engagement, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, nice ball point. Yeah, commitment to the fundamentals of, of talent management. I think by virtue of implementing this system, people now have a healthy understanding about what it means to attract and cultivate talent. And we're now in a position of being able to do that with folks inside our organization. So there shouldn't be any employee that doesn't know how he or she is performing. And there shouldn't be any employee whose pay doesn't reflect their performance on a consistent enterprise-wide basis. Um, there's also, there also shouldn't be in this new system any employee that doesn't understand what his or her gaps are in terms of skills and where they can go to fill those gaps. So we shouldn't be losing people, you know, because we've not spent time developing them or talking to them about their next step. Our loss of people to other companies should not, should not come from that, that source any longer. Did you want to add? And just the last portion where... Um Associated with the implementation, we did uh, online performance reviews and goal setting. And um, as a requirement for managers to be achieve a certain quantity of their bonus, they had to actually implement the goals for their employees. And if they didn't do it, they didn't get a portion of their bonus. 
and, and not, not to our surprise. Funny how it works. <laughs> uh, virtually all of our managers actually went in and put in goals for their employees, but absent, to, absent linking that to their compensation, the, the, the percentage would have been much lower. And, and I think that's the realization. People now understand that we're serious about performance management and development of our people because we're tying their compensation to getting that done. And that's never happened before. So, lessons learned. Um, you know, I'll skip the first, because this is the first thing, the conference room pilot is unique to Accenture's approach to implementations, um, and that bleeds into a little bit uh, of number two, and that is that I probably would have, if I had to do it all over again, um, put together a team with a little different focus. I spent a lot of time picking people to sit on this implementation team that represented each geographic kind of division of our company feeling like that person would be the standard bearer for what is unique in the West or unique in the South. Um, I would say that became less <coughs> critical over time. What became more critical was having functional expertise. So I should have gone after the best recruiter, you know, in terms of process. I should have gone after somebody with the best understanding of performance management and what competencies and qualifications should look like and spend less time worrying about did they come from the south or the west or the east because at the end of the day it was building that functional uh, capacity that mattered not having somebody be able to say you know we had representation from the west or, or the south so I would have done that earlier um, than I did one of the big ahas for us is we're obviously implementing a number of components of SAP's human capital management module what we found is that there are a lot of clients who implement learning, and that's it, or recruiting, and that's it, or payroll, and that's it. We're one of the few companies implementing everything. And you would say to yourself, well, but it's all SAP. It should all fit together like a pretty puzzle, right? Kind of, right? Kind of. Um, and that was the big aha for us. All that integration of all that functionality as we went from release one to release two to release to the re release three to release four was hugely complex, much more so than we ever anticipated. And things we thought that would nicely fit together because it's supposed to didn't. Um, and with a tight timeline, you know, with tremendous pressure to get it done in 18 months, um, we went live with some ugliness. We went live with workarounds. We went live with huge pain points in the field where they had to do some manual maneuverings to make it work while we continued to fix <coughs> defects and keep moving, just for the sake of getting it done. Um, so this is complex. Um, I'll focus on this really and then we'll move to the next slide. We overpromised and underdelivered on reports and this is important because think back to my employee transaction where finance is signing off on an employee transaction, all 20 of them. Um, the, the way we got finance to let go of some of that authority, of some of that control, was by promise of all of the reports we would be able to give them so that they understood there was no abuse. So they could be convinced that people were signing off or approving transactions that were appropriate. So we promised a lot, and I would say that we've come in probably at a C, C grade in delivering what we promised. Um, some of that is just our attention's been dedicated to the implementation itself. Some of it is we wanted to take a very careful and thoughtful approach to reporting because we can't have everybody running reports in the system. We needed a governance strategy. We needed to understand what would be standard reports. We needed to understand where we're going to push reports or let people pull data. And we didn't have all those answers. So as a result, we've been kind of stymied in this area. And you know, finances come back, rightly so, and said, hey, you know, we, we gave you a little room here to maneuver, but we're expecting that we're going to get more data because we haven't seen it yet. So we're having to step up on this um, in a big way. Okay, let's go to the next. So milestones. Obviously, we have a credible system of record. Um, you know, we've moved from 20 ad hoc systems that were all attached to our enterprise version 2 system to one common system where we all get our data. We've moved from paper to electronic. I talked about that. We created these structures in SAP, um, you know, so people have a true understanding and access to data for the folks that work for them. We created the service center, which I talked about. Um, we have a common, consistent performance management uh, tool that's driving performance um, in a way that, that's never happened in our company. 
Um, and for the first time, we have that circle that you saw in the beginning slides where we can identify talent, hire them quickly in an automated environment, right? Identify what the skill gaps of that person are, get them the training needed so that they can perform their position and move up in the company. We've now completed that circle. Final thoughts. No good time. There is no time. Uh, there is no good time for a system implementation ever. Um, there are a million reasons why we shouldn't do this. There are a million reasons why we shouldn't do it all at once. There are a million reasons why we shouldn't do it in 18 months. But we jumped in, as is our style, and we pulled everybody in the deep end with us, and here we are, um, 18 months later, facing the last, most painful um, release. So there's no good time, and yes, it's painful. Um, it is possible to implement on time and budget. We were slightly over on both, as I indicated. Um, but if you, are, if you are disciplined, and if you can tell your end users no, you can do it. It just depends, you know, what, what's the functionality you want to deliver and what can you live with. We, this is easy for me. <laughs> Autocracy can be a good thing. And that goes back to that ruthless standardization we forced everybody to adhere to. Um, this was an aha moment. Um, I'd be curious Paul's take on this. Um, but the very people that advocated that they wanted this, right, the HR practitioners, our more savvy HR leaders, once we started to deliver this, we're not our advocates, we're not our champions. Um, and, and as a result, we kind of counted on them for the communications and training cascade to occur through normal channels, which was a huge disappointment, um, you know, as, as, we, as we thought through, you know, the, the, the leaders that were part of this team and part of this process. This is my favorite. Um, make sure every member of your team is foxhole worthy. So think of your friends, okay? You're at war, shell fire falling all around you. Who's in your foxhole? And I guarantee you have some good buddies that you like a lot that you'd say, ooh, not in my foxhole, right? Might fall asleep when on watch. Probably doesn't want to get too dirty in the foxhole. We start losing, might run over to the other team's foxhole. Um, having folks that are foxhole worthy in a project like this is critical because you're going to go through some nasty times. You're going to be questioned. Uh, there's going to be field resistance. People are going to tell you you don't understand the business. Um, you're going to have to be out alone on an island um, making decisions and then defending those decisions. Um, at points in the implementation, when you're working through defects and the testing is not going well, there's a lot of short tempers in a confined environment. You better make sure that the people in the foxhole with you are in it for the long haul and see the benefits of what you're implementing. Um, and, and I would say that that's probably been our, one of our true successes is we make changes when we saw that folks weren't foxhole worthy. Good people, great talent, but not foxhole worthy, and we moved them out um, you know, to other positions in the company. But this is critical. Chemistry is everything when you're in this kind of environment. So what's the return on investment? Obviously, I talked about all this. We have reduced errors. We don't have lost fax forms anymore. We're all operating under one system. And as a result, we're able to assess our talent against business needs. Um, managers can actually print off their org charts and see who works for them, be able to share that with folks, um, know what their people make, can make decisions around what the needs of the business look like based on what their organization looks like now. Obviously, we're scalable now for future acquisitions. If we were to announce we were buying Disney today, I'd still panic, but I'd panic less. And I think what's important to understand is when we wash our hands of this in January with the first payout of SAP, we won't be done. Um, one of the reasons, go back, to why we dropped PeopleSoft was we used an eighth of the functionality. So we launched this big, robust system, used payroll and maybe a little bit of the uh, HR or personnel functionality, but nothing else. All right, we've made a huge investment in this system, and my greatest fear is that we don't continue to evolve it. There's a lot of stuff that we just populated in its barest form to get implemented, but there needs to be a constant evolution and refresh of the data in this system for it to be the tool that we intend it to be to help us be competitive. So the journey is not over. 
Um, the worst of the pain will be over in January, but the constant investment in this technology and what it can do for us on the back end is never over. So, any questions? And, and please, Paul, as well, from a PMO standpoint, his own perspective, he's been with the company for many years and, and can give you his thoughts as well. Um, I know it's still kind of early in your implementation, but do you have any way that you can quantify your success rate with SAP? Are there any numbers that you can look at uh, where you're retaining valuable employees? Or? Most of the information we have now is, is, uh, is anecdotal more so than empirical at this point, because we are still working through uh, the various um, phases of implementation. But I can certainly say our, our you know, the hiring managers, again, anecdotally, they, 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 they say it's, it's the process is much much simpler and, and understandable and, and, and efficient. Um, I would say, what else? And ha having just like, a source of record for uh, hierarchy, it's just incredibly valuable for a 90,000 employee, 95,000 employee company where we're going to find out who's your peer in the West Coast. It was, it was based on tribal knowledge historically. Um, so just being able to have a lookup tool saying, all right, so let me see who the president of the, of the West Division is or, or what have you. I know who that is. Let me start drilling down to his organization and find the VP of IT for, for whatever. You can readily do that. So. Most information, I wouldn't say it's, it's we don't have let's say hard empirical data which says, you know, um, we're, 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 we're cutting down approval times from 25 days to two days. We know what, how long it's taking uh, currently, and, and most of our old data was, again, um, more anecdotal. Um, but it's, it's, it, it is evolving, and I think we'll have more data points as we, as we progress uh, and, and, have, and are fully implemented. And, and, apply, and, and honestly, apply more attention, uh, attention to metrics associated with the implementation, which we really haven't had the luxury of time to figure out um, how much are we improving. It's a good question. Do you think 18 months is the right number now, looking back after making this kind of change, or do you think um, change that? I don't think we could have been any, sh any shorter. Uh, and given where we are with an economic climate right now, I don't think it could be any longer. Because if we were to tell our business sponsors that we're going to do another four modules in 2009, we're waiting 18 months for anything. So that's what, kind of what we did with the phased approach. Um, but for what we've implemented, and um, I think 18 months is, is the right number. I think we lost probably two months up front trying to build cons enterprise wide consensus on certain topics instead of saying, Here's how it's going to be. Here's how it's going to be. Give me your top five people. Here's how it's going to be. They're, they're going to make the decisions for the rest of the organization. And if you don't, and you as a as a geography or, or functional group don't want to volunteer your, your best person to make those decisions, then you're going to have to live with the consequences. So we should have been more autocratic in the beginning. Everybody told us try to build consensus through collaboration, get everybody invested in this. But our culture it doesn't lend itself to that anyway. People are used to making their own decisions locally. We should have just said, here's how it's going down. Everybody get comfortable with it, and then we would have saved two months of time. To Paul's point. So I'll give you an anecdotal example where we apply a premium to our call center agents who speak multiple languages, right? So some of said, all right, we're going to give them a dollar extra per an hour. Uh, unless you speak Russian, then it's two dollars extra an hour. Or if you speak some other, you know, Chinese, it's, it's two fifty an hour. I said, you know, that's, it's going to be hard to apply those payrolls across the organization. Of course, it was different in the east and different in the south and, and different in the north. Um, so we said, Here, here's the deal. It's going to be a buck an hour, regardless of language, um, and, and just trying to just just dictating that. Folks said, "All right, let's make it a dollar fifty or whatever, you know, or whatever, whatever." You know, build that consensus saying we're not we're not going to, um, you know, have have tailor made solutions or designs per, per geography. We're going to say, "Here's the business rule. We can negotiate whether it's a dollar an hour, a dollar a quarter hour, but that's that's what it's going to be." We allowed for too much negotiation up front, and we learned the lesson of that because the deeper we got into implementation, the fewer choices we let the field locations weigh in on. You know, at a certain point in, in the implementation, we said, here's how it is, and if you feel really strongly about our decision, write a business case to, to suggest we go a different direction. And of course, when you put the onus on them to write the business case, it, it doesn't happen. Um, we should have taken that approach early. I have a lot of questions. 
Sure. The first one is what keeps both of you up at night um, with regard to this implementation? You probably have maybe slightly different answers, but what scares you? I think we share the first answer most immediately, not launching payroll on time. That would scare the dickens out of me in terms of um, everything we've done up to this point will be for naught if we do not launch payroll successfully. Um, and we know we're going to have bumps in that process and there'll be people that aren't paid correctly and we'll be doing retros and doing some adjustments. But I think from a project standpoint, credibility standpoint of the work that's been done thus far, um, that's that's my concern is is making sure we close this loop and have a true success story to talk about in a month um, and then long term I worry about us not making the continuous investment um, in what needs to be built out in this system for it to help us um, competitively and for us to end up in a situation like we did with PeopleSoft where you know the finance powers that be say well you know do we really need SAP with all these enhancements that we're paying for, can't we do with some other, you know, kind of lower level database? And we end up scrapping the work that's been done here like we did with PeopleSoft. That would be my long-term concern, that we don't build this out and leverage it for the investment we've made in it. So my, my, my biggest one is, is resources, right? Uh, having the appropriate qualified resources on the team. SAP resources are hard to find, hard to keep, very expensive. Um, so my technical guys, um, they, they, they use the acronym SAP for Salary Acceleration Program because they know that by virtue of, of, of getting involved with SAP that they're, they're, they're instantly marketable and they can very quickly move up a salary scale at, at a rate, let's say, twice or three times faster than, let's say, a .NET developer, right, which is more of a commodity scale because they'll have, it's like SAP intentionally, I don't know if this is true or false, but they intentionally don't offer a lot of recurring training. Um, and so the, the, the pool of resources that, that, that have that skill set is very small. And, and there's no way anybody who knows SAP can know the full breadth of it. There's just so many different functional modules and technical elements that most of the resources, even if they're, I am the personnel administration configuration subject matter expert, a person can make a living for like the next 20 years, just knowing that, that very narrow uh, aspect. A good living. A good living. A really good living, yeah. So that, that's what keeps me awake, at, worrying that where we're going to find the next, um, less so an ABAP developer, because again, that's, that's I don't want to say that's certainly not a commodity skill, but more around basis skills um, and uh, configuration skills. Those are the big ones, because those, those are the ones that require particularly on the configuration side, you're not just an appreciation for the technology, but an understanding of the business process. So. Did you have a question? You had a hand. Uh, I'm not sure if this had any effect on it, but um, the construction and the transfer over to the new building in Philadelphia, so, did that have any you know what, and Paul made fun of my <laughs> bullet point on one of those slides where it said space matters. Okay. Space does matter. We actually, um, <laughs> When we assembled our team, we took them out of our old building, which is at 1500 Market, where the clothespin is, and moved them to the Wanamaker building, where Macy's is. And an upstairs floor that was Accenture space. It was all cubes, open space. We outgrew it very quickly. So we ended up with people literally sitting at card tables side by side. That was the best space because you could hear what was going on. You had the testing team sitting next to the technical team, next to the functional team. and you know, while some of our people had to adapt because they were used to offices and windows and here they're in this, you know, kind of war room setting, we probably were our most productive and most efficient in that space. So we moved from that space into 1500 Market, our old building now, um, where we still have space and we've set up. But I'll tell you, we're in offices, we're in nicer cubes, we're spaced out, there's a lot of room, but it's not as efficient. Um, and we timed those moves in between releases and obviously at not critical periods, but um, space does matter. Yeah, and we didn't have physical space at the new building for right. the, the project team, which is, which is 73 people as of uh, last Friday. In addition um, to the service center, which is another right. 70. Right. So um, it's both good, a good thing and a bad thing. It, it, it developed that by virtue of everybody and the same, your functional folks and your, t and your technical folks and your and your, your communication people and your testing people, they're all in, in literally email. It was not necessarily 
the mode of communication. It was walk down the hall mm -hmm. and get, I don't want to say get in somebody's face, but that, that's, that's how things got done. And that's, 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 the right, um, that's the right environment for something of, of, of this time timeline and an aggressive uh, schedule. Now we waste a lot of time walking the floor, going up and down a floor to find somebody, and it's not as efficient. But yeah, timing our moves was critical to minimizing the disruption, and then the space does matter.